Welcome to Nahum Marsh. My name is Brian Ritter. I, I serve as the uh, executive director here at Nahum Marsh. Um, but I've also had a lot of experience in the Boundary Waters. Um, I've been going there for about 21 years now. Most years I go at least once. And I, the reason I go is because I, I take students. And so I've been taking students up there for uh, 20 years now. And um, I think it's one of the most special places in the Midwest, one of the most special places on Earth. And it's a great place to take students, especially in this day and age because we're so tied to technology and there is no technology there. And I think that's really one of the benefits of it is to get off the grid for a week and um, get back to the basics. And I, I usually come back from the Boundary Waters physically just exhausted, but mentally totally refreshed. And so I, I always like to survey how many of you have been to the Boundary Waters before, or any wilderness area for that matter. OK, great. Um, so the Boundary Waters is Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness is one wilderness. We're not going to go into all of them tonight, but I'll give you a kind of a broad overview of, of um, the Wilderness Act and kind of what wilderness is. But I, I wanted to start, you know, what is wilderness? Because there's various definitions. If you look back historically, wilderness was kind of viewed as a, a nemesis in a way, that it was a wild and savage place that it was you know, almost evil in a sense, and something to, to be tamed. Um, you know, a little later, people started viewing wilderness as like nature in its purest form, um, untouched by humans or untouched by man. Um, is it a place with no permanent human habitation or roads? That's kind of the legal definition of wilderness in the United States anyways. Um, I don't have the answers to these, but just something to think about. What, in your mind, what is wilderness? Do we have wilderness in Iowa? It's a question. I would argue that we probably don't have wilderness left in Iowa. Uh, or, and, and if, we, if it's in Illinois, it's maybe Shawnee is the only closest thing to wilderness. Question is, was North America ever wilderness? What about if, if your definition of wilderness is untouched by humans, what about the Native Americans who lived here for 15,000 years? Is there a place in North America that was ever untouched by humans in the last 15,000 years? So just something to, to ponder. Um, can we get back close to that? I, I would argue that we can. Well, you know, this concept of wilderness really coming from the European or Euro-American perspective, if we look back in time, Europe, um, this is a map of uh, sort of primary or, or virgin forest, uncut forest through the ages. And you can look that uh, as we go through time, by about 1000 AD, most of the forests in Central Europe and Western Europe were cut. And the forests that are in places like Germany today, the estimate have been cut 10 to 12 times over and have regrown. So that it's nothing like the primordial forests that were there 2,000 years ago. Um, so by 1850, almost all of European forests, except in Scandinavia and in the high mountain ranges, had been cut. So as Europeans were coming to North America, they certainly found uh, an, an environment that was radically different than the environment that they had altered over the last several thousand years. And they viewed this very much as wilderness. So this is Europe today uh, looking at the remaining sort of old growth forests. There's not a whole heck of a lot left. Uh, northern reaches, like I said, Finland and then some of the high mountain ranges in the Alps uh, is where it remains. The U.S. kind of followed that same pattern, though, as soon as, uh, and this is just forest. Now, wilderness can be desert, can be prairie, uh, could be the oceans. But in terms of forest, you know, most of the eastern U.S. was heavily forested, but the loss of the forest really follows the, the pattern of Euro-American settlement that as we moved across, as we settled an area, pretty quickly, 
uh, those areas were deforested. And people would deforest an area and wood was the major source of fuel, was the major source of um, building materials. And once they deforested an area, they moved further, further west until pretty much all of the western United States had been clear cut. There, there was virtually no virgin forest left in the eastern United States except very small patches high in the Appalachians. Like Joyce Kilmer is one place in North Carolina that has some old growth trees left. So um, keeping that in mind that most of uh, Europe was, most of the true wilderness in Europe is gone. And, and as Euro-American Euro settlers moved across the US, they, the idea that they had to tame the wilderness was really a, a genuine concept. Well, by the 19, well, really by the late uh, 19th century, people like John Muir um, were, and, and Teddy Roosevelt and others saw this loss of wilderness as a real threat to the United States, and they worked really hard to try to protect some of the remaining lands that were left, and that those were places in the West. Out of this sort of growing movement and growing concern for um, you know, the deforestation and loss of wilderness, a group called the Wilderness Society was founded in 1935. Now there are two Iowans that were members of the original founding group of the Wilderness Society. Um, one of them is this guy. Does anybody recognize nope. him? So Aldo Leopold. You've never read a Sand County Almanac that really is the, the Bible for modern day conservation. Aldo Leopold, anybody know where he was born? Burlington. Burlington, Iowa, just a few, uh, few hours south of here. So Leopold was born in Burlington, spent, uh, went to Yale School of Forestry, spent his early career out west, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, and eventually settled in um, Wisconsin. He was a professor at uh, UW-Madison, but bought a shack in the sand counties near Baraboo. The shack is still there, you can visit it, but I love this quote by him. I'm glad I will not be young in a future without wilderness. So, um, you know, he was at the last sort of, that came to be, you know, grew up in that last sort of stages of wilderness in Arizona and New Mexico and, and things like that, but was, instrumental in founding the Wilderness Society. About 1947, when he was six or seven, somewhere along there when he died. 1948, so he had just written uh, Sand County Almanac. It was right before it was published, he died of a heart attack fighting a, a wildfire on his property. This other guy is probably lesser known. Both of these guys, both important. One was from Davenport. Anybody know what? So Ernest Oberholzer. Ernest Oberholzer was born right here in Davenport, Iowa. Uh, grew up here. He's buried here, but he spent most of his life uh, in what is now sort of the Boundary Waters area, and was instrumental and was really the main driving force to getting uh, this part of the country protected, northern Minnesota, southern Canada. That was his friend and guide, um, an Ojibwe native named Billy McGee. And I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a little bit. But 1964, this um, significant piece of legislation was signed into law by LBJ. It was the Wilderness Act. And this is the definition of wilderness that they presented. A wilderness in contract, contrast with those areas where man and his own works dominate the landscape is hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its communities of life are untrammeled by man where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. So that is the legal definition of what a wilderness is. Yeah, initially, the Wilderness Act protected about 11 million acres in the United States. Um, and that's expanded today to over 100 million acres of designated wilderness. Um, this map shows all federal lands and, you know, going back to uh, Euro-American settlement, um, you'll notice most of the federal lands are where? 
in the West, well, the, the last place that was sort of brought into the United States, it was those places that couldn't be farmed. You know, it was mountains and deserts that didn't make good farmland. There is no uh, designated wilderness areas in uh, a few states in the United States. And we'll get to that in a second. But if you look at this map, you think, well, the West is well protected, but actually the yellow is Bureau of Land Management land, which really is kind of the least level of protection of any federal land. You can still mine Bureau of BLM land. You can still uh, log it. You can still um, run four-wheelers through there, hunt it. You can run cattle through there. So it's, it's, not, um, it's not like our national parks or wilderness areas kind of a, uh, fairly open in terms of use. So once again, another map of the designated wilderness areas in the US, and it's really not that much. Most of it is in Alaska, actually. If you think about the lower 48 states, there really isn't a whole lot of wilderness, um, true designated wilderness areas. So we're gonna take a quick quiz, see what you guys know about wilderness. <laughs> if you, uh, if you pass, we'll roll out the lobster and steak dinner for you. If you don't pass, uh, it's, you're sticking with popcorn. Um, so how many wilderness areas are in the National Wilderness uh, Preserve System? How many different, well, not acres, but how many different wilderness areas? What do you have a guess? 350. 350? Uh, 803. 800, 803 different wilderness areas. What's the total acreage? I already gave you kind of a rough estimate, but um, it's 111 million acres of designated wilderness in the United States. What's the smallest wilderness area, designated wilderness in the U.S.? Um, Pelican Island, Florida. There's a place called Pelican Island Wilderness. It's only 5.5 acres. What's the largest wilderness? Um, it's uh, in a, oh, you can't even see this. Oh, hold on a second. I gotta exit out of this. There we go. What's the largest wilderness? Wrangell St. Elias Wilderness, which is uh, over nine million acres. That's Alaska. Where's the largest area of contiguous wilderness? That's Alaska. So uh, near, the, near the Arctic, gates of the Arctic and Noah talk, 13 million acres combined. That's a pretty nice chunk of wilderness. Which states have the most wilderness? Alaska is one of them. California uh, has 154 wilderness areas, so designated wilderness areas. It actually has the most, not the most acreage, but the most wilderness followed by Arizona, Nevada, Utah, and Alaska. Which ones have the most wilderness? Alaska, 57 million acres of designated wilderness in Alaska. 15 million in, in California. Um, Idaho has 4.7 million. Are there states that don't have any wilderness? Yeah. <laughs> Iowa's one of them. What are some others? There's actually five states, I think. Uh, Connecticut, <laughs> Delaware, uh, pretty small states, Kansas, Maryland, Rhode Island, and Iowa are the five states without any designated wilderness. I don't know that we'll ever get any designated wilderness here. Um, which agency manages the most wilderness? So the thing about wilderness areas is that they're either managed by like national parks, Bureau of Land Management, um, U.S. Forest Service, so um, Forest Service. the Forest Service has 448 different units, which agency manages the most, National Park Service, most acreage, and then um, what's the newest wilderness? <coughs> There's 37 new uh, wilderness areas that were designated in uh, 2019 in California, New Mexico, Oregon, and Utah. And then um, we'll go with this one. How many wilderness areas are named after famous people? I don't know that either. Uh, 26 so far. 
The one that I do want to point out is named after another island. See if you can pick them out, pick that island out of this name. Ding Darling. Ding Darling. Who is Ding Darling? Anybody ever hear of this guy? He was a Des Moines Register cartoonist that FDR recruited and started the duck stamp program. Also was credited with bringing Ding Darling down in Florida. Yep, so this is a 2,000 acre wilderness area. I know you know a lot about that place now. <coughs> love to visit this place. Um, so Ding Darling, yeah, was, think about when Ding Darling was doing his cartoons in the 1920s and 30s, this was before the internet. This was a way to bring conservation messages to the masses. People got their information from the newspaper and not, um, you know, not social media or whatever. So uh, some really great cartoons that he has. And, so anyways, Wilderness Act was passed in 1935. Really, these two guys were a driving force be behind getting the Wilderness Act passed eventually in 1964, I should say. They were part of the Wilderness Society. They were the ones that sort of drafted up the original proposed legislation. And eventually, these areas were protected. Um, now on to one specific wilderness area, the Boundary Wall. So the Boundary Waters uh, Wilderness Area uh, is in northern Minnesota. It's part of Superior National Forest and um, close to Voyagers National Park. And right across the border is a provincial park in Canada called Quetico. So a pretty s spectacular area in terms of land size. And going back to these two guys, why these two guys were important is because Ernest Oberholzer was kind of an interesting guy. He grew up in Davenport when he was 17, he came down with rheumatic fever, and the doctors gave him a year to live. And he kind of reminds me a little bit of Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt was really sickly, and the doctor said, you're not going to survive, and just stay in bed. Well, he pushed his limits, and so he got interested in in documenting what he thought were disappearing cultures. And so he went up to the, this area, Rainy Lake, and became um, learned Ojibwe, uh, Chippewa, and um, became friends with several Chippewa natives, Ojibwe natives, and started documenting their culture, documenting how they used plants, uh, place names, things like that. And in 1909, he, with Billy McGee, spent uh, about six months and traveled 3,000 miles by canoe to sort of map the entire uh, Rainy Lake watershed, um, which is really the, the Boundary Waters area. And if you can imagine, in 1909, they didn't have Kevlar canoes back then. They didn't have dehydrated meals, so it was um, quite an extensive journey. Three years later, he and Billy uh, took uh, a giant Kodak camera with them, and they traveled to Hudson Bay by canoe. Um, it took them six months. There were no roads at the time. There was really very uh, scattered maps of the area, and they uh, barely made it. There's a great book about their journey. Uh, it's, I think it's called Two Magnetic North. Um, you should look it up, but great photos and so anyways, he was really critical in saving the Boundary Waters because he recognized the value of it, the significance of it, and got the right people involved at the right time to save it. 1909 uh, is when Superior National Forest was created. Most of Superior at the time, the 640,000 acres that were protected, were lands that had already been logged or had recently gone through forest fires. So it really wasn't, um, you know, prime land for, for loggers or anything else like that. Uh, same year, they, they established Quetico Forest Reserve right across the border. 1909 was when Ernest, Ernest Overholzer did his journey. 1925 is when the real battle started because there's a lumber baron named uh, Edward Backus that wanted to build 
a series of seven hydroelectric dams in the Rainy Lake watershed to dam it up for hydroelectric power, but also to be able to dam it up so that they could log it and get the logs out of, out of the area. And um, this is when Ernest Overholzer went into action. He uh, got the Secretary of Ag to establish a roadless area in Superior National Forest. That helped to slow down uh, this project. And eventually, um, what really helped was there are several sort of wealthy businessmen from Minneapolis, St. Paul, that would go up to that area to hunt and fish, and they, they didn't want to see it destroyed. And so they sort of backed Overholzer. They formed this quite a close superior council, and um, eventually Herbert Hoover passed this law to essentially prevent logging in um, and alteration of lake levels in the Rainy Lake watershed, which includes the boundary waters. 1934, FDR points um, Ernest Overholzer to this National Superior Quetical Advisory Board. Uh, Isaac Walton Lee gets involved in 1943 to create more roadless areas and to start buying up these little private resorts that were in the boundary waters. And um, 1948, Another act was passed to create more roadless areas. This was very controversial in 1949. Truman signed into law uh, a law that essentially prevented these little puddle jumpers um, from flying too low over the boundary waters. So they created this airspace where you had to be at least 4,000 feet above. And um, that really was quite controversial because all these little resorts really survived off of so it wasn't, the point of this is it wasn't an easy kumbaya type transition that this, uh, a lot of the locals were really pissed about this. There was a woman that came to the last talk who grew up in Ely and she still holds some resentment because her dad made a living as a fishing guide in the Boundary Waters and when they implemented all these acts and they, they didn't allow motorized boats anymore, it kind of killed his livelihood. Sense. 1958, the Superior Roadless Area was renamed the Boundary Waters Canoe Area. 1964, Wilderness Act was passed. And, um, further protection in 1972, Nixon <coughs> created uh, or prohibited the use of, of snowmobiles in the Boundary Waters. Um, Voyagers National Park was established in 1975, and Ernest Overholzer died in 1977. That's his gravestone in uh, Oakdale Cemetery. So, uh, big spider bets buried there. A lot of famous people in Oakdale Cemetery. But I like that uh, quote. His Indian name uh, was uh, Storyteller. So. 1978 was really a major passage in that it severely restricted uh, mining activities around the Boundary Waters and restricted motorized boats to only a quarter of, of the Boundary Water areas. The rest, you can only travel by canoe or kayak. So I like to, basically, the larger an area is, the less loss of native species you have. So if you look, one of the largest contiguous, like, national, um, park areas is, this is actually in Canada, the Banff, Jasper, 20, uh, over 20,000 square kilometers, and they've lost zero of their original species in that park. Whereas you compare it to much smaller areas like Bryce Canyon, they've lost 36% uh, of their original species that once existed there. So the point of this is, is bigger is better, and when you're looking at protecting biological diversity, you need larger tracts of land to be able to do that. So what is the, if you, we look at the boundary waters with Quetico and Superior National Forest and everything else, Voyagers is 218,000 acres. Superior National Forest, including the boundary waters, is 3.9 million. And Quetico is about 1.1 million. So about 5.3 million acres that's a pretty good chunk of, that, that is one of the largest chunks 
of sort of wilderness and parkland together in, in certainly in the Midwest and one of the largest chunks that's west of the, uh, or east of the Mississippi, or east of the, the Rocky Mountains. Um, if you've ever been to the Boundary Waters, you know that there's given entry points. You can't just put your canoe in wherever you want. You have to go into certain entry points. And um, that is beneficial. You have to get permits. They restrict the number of visitors every year. Some people would argue they're not restricting it enough, but um, we'll get into that in a minute. So once again, you can kind of look at the lay of the land. A little bit of, um, here's some of the different entry points for the boundary waters. There's only a set number and a set number of permits issued every year. But I want to talk a little bit about sort of the geology and the biology of the boundary waters. It's one of the few places in the United States where you can see Precambrian rock. So how old is Precambrian? Really, really old. Precambrian is uh, yeah, older than uh, older than uh, about six hundred million six hundred million years. Most yeah, older than dirt. Most of the rock there is. Uh, is a uh, really hard granite um, that's, that was formed two billion plus years ago. Um, now that, that rock exists in other places, but it's so far below the surface that it's not accessible. So how did that rock get there? Or, or why is that rock exposed is kind of the question. Well, part of it has to do with glaciation. And the, the glaciers that came in and out of Minnesota and Canada over the last two million years. This, you can barely see it, but this is the only area of Minnesota that wasn't covered in ice uh, two million years ago with the Nebraska glacier. So all of northern Minnesota up there was covered. 400,000 years ago, so that melted, and then another glacier came in, the Kansan Glacier, 400,000 years ago. Uh, the Illinoisan Glacier. Notice the only place, and this is a total side note, but the only place that didn't get glaciated at that time is uh, southeastern Minnesota and northeastern Iowa, and a little bit of Wisconsin and Illinois. The Driftless area, if you've ever been up there, the topography is way different than it is here because of the lack of glaciation. But uh, the Illinoisan Glacier, so all these glacial events were just coming in and scraping off the layers of soil and rock that had been deposited previously. And what it left behind was some, uh, the, the bedrock, and that was granite, really hard rock that's up there. So 30,000 years ago, uh, the last glacier started moving in. That was the Wisconsin Glacier. There were several advances and retreats. Finally, the last one, the last sort of push was 10,000 years ago, and what happened was when that glacier came in, it dropped off a bunch of really rich soil in the red areas. Um, that was the glacial till, and so ground up rock, the parent material for, for soil. The other areas were kind of scraped off, especially that corner of Minnesota, that, that uh, northeastern corner of Minnesota, and that is what led to the different uh, ecosystems that formed after the glaciers left. Really rich soils led to the grasslands, and so the tan areas where the prairies are, where, uh, where the boundary waters is though, it was mainly conifers and some aspen and birch that ended up getting in there. Another look at that, a sort of broader view is, I like that Laurentian mixed forest province. So there's, uh, this was a plate, the Laurentian plate that, um, this is kind of where that plate, that ancient plate, North America was in that uh, area of North, uh, the Boundary Waters, that's where it gets its name. So in terms of the human history, eight to 10,000 years ago, um, they think the first people were moving into the Boundary Waters, but they weren't staying very long. There's not a ton of archeological evidence until more recently. I think it was more of a passive sort of hunting ground that people probably didn't live there year round. 
Um, there are very few artifacts even going back 6,000 years ago. Um, they start finding more pottery. By 1600, the first contact with Euro-Americans, Euro it was the Dakota <laughs> people that were actually living there. They were pretty quickly pushed out by the Ojibwe. The Ojibwe were originally from farther east, but the Ojibwe became buddies with the French through their fur trapping. The French got them guns and meant that Ojibwe had an advantage and were able to sort of push the, the Dakota people out and they established as the, the main people. The Ojibwe are still there. Um, there is, if you've ever been into Lac La Croix, which is this, one of the largest lakes in the Boundary Waters, um, there's actually a resort called Campbell's Island, which is right in here. And right next to the resort is uh, Ojibwe Village. Um, there's about 300 people that still live in that village uh, reserve. And um, that's a, they're, completely isolated there. There's no roads that lead there. So they have motorized boats. To get their supplies, they go to Campbell's Island and buy their supplies. And they do hunt, fishing and hunting guiding there, but um, fairly impoverished conditions, though. So I mentioned the fur trade. Beavers drove sort of the settlement of the Boundary Waters. This is a little exaggerated. I've never seen any beavers that uh, were behaving like this. Um, but uh, what this was was an English article that in the 1700s about the vast amount of fur that was. Everybody in Europe in the in the 16 and 1700s was wearing fur, and beaver was like gold back then. Beaver was the currency, and so that brought in the voyagers. The voyagers were uh, French, usually young men that could carry uh, up to 100 pounds on their back that would travel deep into the, the, the Boundary Waters area to trap beaver and other animals. And um, mostly because people, the style at the time were those uh, hats, beaver hats that um, essentially were made of beaver felt. and. As a side note, hat makers at the time um, would have their hands in mercury all day long because that's how they cured the felt. And uh, if you've ever heard of the Mad Hatter or being mad as a hatter, it was a real thing. The hat makers in Europe at the time um, would go crazy after a while because mercury destroys your central nervous system and um, they'd have jumbled speech and excited behavior and everything else. And anyways. That was a side note to the, uh, the, the beaver trade. So beaver were abundant in North America and especially in places like the Boundary Waters at the time. In 1500, it was estimated that there were 60 million beavers living in North America. But by 1900, there was only 100,000 left. Um, so the beaver trade, luckily some people have said that the change in fashion in Europe really saved the beaver because had people still been wearing beaver hats and beaver coats and things like that, the beavers almost certainly would have been wiped out of North America. They have recovered fairly well. Today there's about 10 to 15 million. There's a beaver right there. You can see the, the size, you know, beavers are really large rodents. They can get to be 75 to 100 pounds. Um, so they were the primary source of fur and that's how those voyagers lived, too. They would live off of beaver meat and wild game, and it was not an easy existence. A little further on, um, this was the last permanent residence, resident of the area that is now designated as the Boundary Waters. So, uh, there's a museum dedicated to her in Ely now. Um, her name was Dorothy Moulter, and she was known as the Root Beer Lady. So she... Um, uh, her, her and her husband had moved from out east and bought a resort. And when they introduced the no-fly law in 1949, it pretty much forced them to shut down their resort. Her husband died shortly after, and for her to make a living, she decided to start making root beer and selling it to all the canoeists that were coming through the area. And so 
she lived up there in the wilderness by herself for about 35 years. And that's, she'd go into, into Ely in the winter time, you know, take a sled and get all her supplies, and that's how she survived. When she died, they actually moved her cabin into Ely, and U.S. Forest Service took over the land, and it's now part of the Boundary Waters. Is that a fish that she's holding there? I, yeah, big, uh, big, looks like walleye bass or there. walleye, I'm guessing, yeah. Um, some of the critters that live in the, the Boundary Waters, pine martens, uh, once lived in Iowa, believe it or not, but they, by probably the early 1800s, they were already on their way out anyways because the landscape was changing. Um, their populations are recovering, but they were hunted pretty uh, in, in large numbers for their fur as well. These guys are in the weasel family, just like mink. Um, the largest weasel family member in that area was this guy, the fisher. I've seen one of these in the Boundary Waters before, just hanging in a tree with his long tail hanging down. Solitary animals, um, known for being pretty ferocious. They're one of the few animals that will actually kill and eat porcupine. Um, they'll grab them by the face and flip them over and attack their belly. But um, you rarely get to see them. They're very, they're fairly secretive. They don't even like being around other fishers except during breeding season. So they're very much a solitary animal. Porcupines are kind of one of those token species of the great north woods. I've never seen a living one. I've seen plenty on the road up there, uh, <laughs> driving too Ely, but um, they're, they, they seem to be doing fine in terms of their population. Moose, on the other hand, are not doing well. Moose numbers are plummeting in northern Minnesota. Um, and there's a couple reasons why they think that's happening. I, I, when I first started going to the Boundary Waters 20 plus years ago, we would see moose occasionally. I haven't seen a moose in many years now up there. But part of the issue is that when this area was logged, it made it more hospitable for white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer then moved in, and white-tailed deer carry several diseases, several parasites that moose cannot tolerate. And so when the white-tailed deer started arriving around 100 years ago, uh, moose started, population started to decline. The other thing is the winters are getting warmer up there. And as winters have gotten warmer, more ticks are surviving. And they, there's a researcher I met a couple years ago when I was up there, and she said that they're finding ticks with literally thousands of, uh, they're finding moose with thousands of ticks on their rump and other areas, and that just weakens the, the moose to a point where they can't uh, successfully have babies and things like that. So warmer winters means more ticks, and more ticks means more trouble for these guys. Caribou were in the Boundary Waters until 1981. The last verified caribou sighting in the Boundary Waters was in the early <clears throat> 80s. And probably the same thing happened, they think, as uh, happening to moose today, that these deer, uh, as they came in, pretty much, uh, you know, brought new diseases that caribou were not tolerant of, and the caribou died out. Black bears are doing fine there. I've seen uh, black bears on several occasions. Uh, there probably was grizzly bear there a, a long, long time ago, but not anymore. Wolves have come back fairly well. We were up there a year and a half ago and we heard wolves call back and forth to them. Um, lynx are not doing very well. Lynx are incredibly rare in the north woods now. And, uh, snowshoe hares are still fairly common, but um, the dreaded red squirrel are everywhere. <laughs> If you've ever uh, gone to the Boundary Waters and not locked your food up well, um, the, the red squirrels will get it. Yeah, they're good enough to eat, though. Yeah. And uh, chipmunks are even worse. Uh, chipmunks will chew right through your bag. I, 
I've had students go up there and I always tell them, do not put food in your bag and they don't listen. And yeah. sure enough, those guys will chew, chew right through your tent, get into your bag. Mini bears. Well, yeah, <laughs> mini bears. Um, grouse are abundant. If, the first time I heard, one of the first times I was up there was kind of late spring, early summer. And I was laying in my tent early in the morning and I thought I was having a heart attack. I felt this pounding, and it turned out it was a it was a grouse. It was a rough grouse beating its wings rapidly. If you ever get a chance, listen, look up their their drumming. But um, these guys are deadly. So I was portaging one time, and uh, the the guys in front of me. I was just up there with some friends, and I heard this ruckus, and I thought, oh my God, they're getting attacked by a bear. And one guy came running back past me, and. The other guy had a fishing pole and was waving it. Well, it was a male grouse was uh, chasing them down the, the trail. So um, they were standing their ground. Loons, of course, are like the token bird of the North Woods. The, the, the call of the loon is just mesmerizing. Um, loons are also declining. And part of the reason they're declining is because their um, feathers have oil in them. And the way they stay warm is that oil keeps the water out. Well, as more and more people are using soap in the boundary waters to bathe and wash their dishes, which they shouldn't do, you shouldn't do that in the water, that's starting to become a problem for the loons and their numbers are, are dropping among, of course, the state bird of Minnesota. Uh, the mosquitoes can be horrific up there at times. And there, there are challenges, ecologically speaking, Earthworms are not native to the boundary waters. The glaciers wiped them out. Earthworms were probably not native where we're at in Iowa. Southern Iowa maybe had them. But the soils on the islands and in the forest and the boundary waters is very fragile. It's very thin. And as fishermen have released their worms, those earthworms turn, turn over the soil too rapidly. It's changing the soil where other plants are now moving in and replacing them pine and spruce forest. Deer, I mentioned that I'm not sure what to do about the deer population or worms. I don't, you know, worms are, I don't know how we're going to get rid of those. But, mountain lions and wolves. Yeah, there you go. Um, the local economy is a challenge up there. The, those little towns around the boundary waters are economically depressed. And, you know, historically they were relied on logging and guiding and, and mining and things like that. And um, really the sort of the major source of income is um, tourism. And so whenever I take a group up there, I intentionally use a local outfitter, you know, to get our food, to get our boats, because that's how they make a living. And those are the people that are on the front lines of protecting the boundary waters. So, you know, I, I could do a trip a lot cheaper if I brought my own gear and brought my own canoe, but that you're not pumping money into the local economy. So, um, there's propulse uh, sulfide mining on the edge of the boundary waters that's been controversial. Now, I just saw an article the other day that that's been, there's a moratorium on that. Um, it's one of those challenging things though. Uh, minerals, um, if we don't produce them here, we gotta rely on foreign nations. And so, you know, it's a double-edged sword, but Climate change is definitely impacting the region. If you look at uh, climate change, that's not lightning or thunder, by the way, it's the trains. <laughs> um, I thought it was a grouse. <laughs> the, yeah, the killer grouse are coming. Um, climate change is, in northern regions, the northern regions are getting impacted more quickly than, uh, you know, um, areas closer to the equator. Temperatures are changing more rapidly in places like the Boundary Waters in Canada. Um, they're seeing increased temperatures and increased forest fires. There were forest fires there this year. They were in a terrible drought. They had incredible heat this year for northern Minnesota. They had temperatures a couple days up in the hundreds, which is 20 years ago even was unheard of. Um, there's invasive species, as I mentioned. And there's a, a lot of visitors. When we went in, uh, 2020, part of the pandemic, still going on, I know, but 
um, the Canadian border was closed, so people who would typically go into Quetico couldn't get to Quetico. And there were places where there were like traffic jams at the portages, which I'd never encountered before. I remember the one portage we had to sit and wait, I don't know, like an hour for all the people that were coming in and going out. And this was a statement from the U.S. Forest Service during COVID-19. We saw unprecedented visitation to the Boundary Waters and along with that, an unacceptable high amount of resource damage, including cutting of live trees, human waste not being properly disposed of, trash left in campfire rings, illegal entry, food not being properly stored, disruptive and oversized groups, lack of BWCA permits, improper food storage, and campfires left unattended. So it's supposed to be a wilderness area, but there were places, especially when you get really close to the entry points, that were just, it was like you were in Chicago or something. It was just incredible the number of people. And so that impacts things. This is the Rainy Lake watershed. This is a map. This is the concern about, um, you know, some of the mining activities that are being proposed that, that could, if something spilled, that could get into the, and, and, and affect the entire watershed. Um, these are the areas of old growth forests that have burned since uh, 1919. So there's actually been, even this year, there were several fires that happened in the Boundary Waters. And uh, like I said, as the climate warms and you know probably some other factors are leading to more and more uh, forest fires in the, in the Boundary Waters area. One thing that really impacted it was in 1999, there was a massive windstorm that blew down about a million trees near Grand Array. And where, where were you leaving me on that map? Uh, good question. Yeah, right here. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's there. Yeah. I'm going to be far east. Yeah. So um, the, the blowdown really took place kind of in this area here. There were several fires that followed, you know, a million trees laying on the ground in 10 years is going to be coming tender. And so that area has, was really negatively impacted. Um, <laughs> but it is still a wonderful <laughs> place to visit despite uh, that. there's record record breaking fish that you can catch now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one, uh, this whopper kept us alive and fed the whole group. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, just incredible beauty, um, you know, like I said, despite the challenges, I've uh, been to very few places where I felt that far off the grid and felt that remote, you know. Um, so this is just a look at some of the lakes. I believe I camped at this place. There's a, there is a campsite up on that bluff. This is in Lac La Croix. Um, this is one of my favorite campsites that we ever stayed at, just overlooking the lake, uh, incredibly blue water. The water up there is just crystal clear. If you've been there, you know you can see eight to 10 feet down in some of those lakes. Um, now, some people claim you can drink the water. I, I, uh, I, I never let my students, I, I strongly encourage that my students don't drink right out of the lake. I, and I, I, I drill this into them over and over. You've got to filter your water. Well, several years ago, I took a group, and I, they were kind of a couple of loose cannons in the group. And the first day in, you know, it's a warm day. We just got done portaging, and I look back, and the guy's dipping his cup right into the lake. And, and sure enough, he paid the price the rest of the week. Um, he had to stay pretty close to the toilet. I had to way out in the middle. And it, it, Probably 12, 15 years ago. So. Yeah, I know people that will, will drink it and, you know, I just There's better the tolerance than me. The Indians up there say that Lake, they Lake can drink it, but they've got a tolerance to it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just like if you've been, go, go to a foreign country, you know, Mexico or something, the locals don't get sick from the water. No. It's just because you're not used they're, to it. They go over the tolerance span. So, I was, I was a fishy. When we went, the fishing wasn't great. You know, we went at the end of July. I've been up there, though, you know, late May, early June, and it's just phenomenal. So, so we, when we go, we do 
you know, we, we swim, but I, we don't want people like bathing in the lake, you know, you bathe away from the lake, you bring your water in. Um, that's the latrine, if you've ever been to the Boundary Waters, it's, they do actually have little pit toilets that they dig. The U.S. Forest Service comes and moves these every uh, couple months, but um, great place to meet some mosquitoes, though, <laughs> the latrine, they're usually abundant there. I found the flies worse than the mosquitoes. Yeah. Yeah, usually if you go a uh, certain time, the black flies are really bad. And you'll have a lull for about a week, and then the mosquitoes are terrible. And so. But another look, this is, I believe, La LaCroix. Um, and then got a short video that our students put together, Allison and um, some others. So I'm going to pull this up give you an idea of what it's like to travel around the Boundary Waters. This will play. <clears throat> I don't know if I should turn this off. You guys have promised to stay awake. Let's see if I can get this to go. Time. You used to always enter through Crane Lake, but it's more difficult now because you got to cross the international border and you have to have a passport. So we've just been going in through Ely the last several years. So this is uh, Little Indian Sioux River, I believe, that we're traveling up that leads you down to some lakes. You can see the hard granite. There's not the sandy beaches there. This is, uh, portage is a French word that translates to hell. <laughs> um, this is what portaging is all about. Uh, get around, you gotta, and the US portages are a little better maintained than the Canada side. Eating is important. Typically I bring like a little propane stove, but they forgot to give us our stove, so we were cooking over the fire, open fire the whole week. But we did have fish. Did we have fish twice or just one? Just one. It's our water filters. Fishing was bad. Oh. Yeah. We were on the move. It's a beautiful waterfall. That's the uh, international boundary right there. It was called Curtain Falls. So, it's a stamping tool. Probably great stargazing. It's phenomenal. Yeah. yeah it's some of the best stars yeah. in So this last video clip, uh, Allison had to put in here. There's a backstory behind this. I'm duct taping my boot. Um, so uh, for years, I had the same pair of boot. I bought these old like army surplus boots. And I probably wore them up to the Boundary Waters 20 times, and they were great. And they finally just wore out. So I went to the army surplus store, got a pair of what I thought were army surplus boots, but they were the cheap Chinese knockoff. And the first day I got in the water, the glue that held the, the sole to the boot uh, melted and the soles of my boots fell off. So uh, always be prepared. A, that's the lesson. It's an unforgiving wilderness though too. It's not just all beauty and, and you know, nature. It, it, things can go wrong and that's the thing I always try to 
emphasize to my students that you have to be prepared and um, if you make a few mistakes, it's not going to end well. So I've been fortunate, I've only had a few students with major accidents. The, the worst one was that, I don't know what the kid was doing. We, some of us went off fishing and I got back and couldn't find the student and there was blood all around. And I'm like, oh no, he's been, well he somehow was chopping wood and fell on a log and it jammed into his face about three inches next to his eye and it was bad. He had, uh, he was in the tent sleeping it off, but we had to uh, paddle about 15 hours to get him to a hospital because it was a large open wound. We couldn't leave him in the wilderness with that. So, um, but I was always a purist. I never wanted to bring a, a satellite phone or anything with me. I always wanted to, you know, compass and no technology, but um, a couple of years ago our outfitter talked me into bringing the satellite phone in case something happened. And, we were paddling and I made a wrong turn. My nickname, these guys nicknamed me Wrong Turn Ritter um, <laughs> up there. But I made a wrong turn and these, this guy came and flagged, flagged our group down and was panicked and his brother was diabetic and was in a diabetic coma and we thought he was already gone. And um, Luckily we had the satellite phone, we were able to call the forest service and about an hour later a plane came in picked the guy up and saved his life. They said what was happening was his blood sugar was really high and his brother thought it was really low and mm -hmm. kept giving him sugar and kept driving him deeper into this diabetic coma. And, uh, so our students saved his life. That was pretty amazing. We loaded him on the plane and got him help and he lived. So you actually had a plane that landed there? I didn't think you could have any motorized or only? Only for emergencies. Okay. They'll, they'll fly in these Little, the Forest Service will fly in these little puddle jumpers and so But it's, a, it's an incredible place if you've never been, you know, get to the edge of it at least. And um, it's a great way to spend a week. Any questions or comments? Yeah. You know, I always watch these Alaskan shows, the last Alaskan. And there's, there's part of people flying their planes around. I love that show. I don't know how realistic it is, but... Um, yeah, I mean, there's still... You still see the planes up there, because there's still a few resorts on the well, Canada that's, side. Well, that's there. Where I'm talking yeah. about the Alaska show. Yeah. And, and, and you know, that, I always watch them, though. Uh, and the game warden <laughs> shows, too. I like that, too. But, uh, yeah, I always question. You know, what the, the, that uh, they only have five properties, and they're not allowing any that Alaskan area. I always watch that, too. Yeah, I mean, that's the same with the Boundary Waters. A lot of these 